once again, good evening, everyone. My name is Emily Voss. I am the Senior Manager of National Programs and Professional Development at the Center for Civic Education. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for Revolutionary Revelations. Uh, this is a, a program we're very excited about. This will unveil some uh, lesser known America's founding primary source treasures. Uh, so we are looking forward to sharing um, quite a few resources with you that you may never have had a chance to see or encounter before. Um, and it's also the very first time we have ever partnered with the American Revolution Institute at the Society of the Cincinnati. Um, so as my colleague Mark just posted in the chat, um, while we're introducing ourselves, please let us know who you are and where you're logging in from. And I see Glenn Manns, who I know is from Kentucky. Hello, Glenn. <laughs> Hello, Emily. Uh, I've got quite a few teachers on, I think, so. Well, great. Well, greetings all of the Kentucky teachers. We've got Lexington, Kentucky, Northern Virginia, Stanton, I see, Kentucky. I see Nova, and I see Elizabeth from my old school district. Hello. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. And I said it from Washington, D.C. That's that's amazing. Well, we're so glad to see all of you and really excited to um, have your your interaction with us this evening. Um, so let me start then by introducing my colleagues. Um, my fellow speakers tonight are Stacia Smith, the director of education. Uh, Rachel Nellis, the Research Services Librarian, and Emily Parsons, Deputy Director and Curator, um, all with the American Revolution Institute at the Society of the Cincinnati. And they will certainly be able to tell you quite a bit more about their amazing resource collection as the evening goes on. So for this evening's um, program agenda, we will be starting out with a close observation activity um, we'll dive more deeply into the American Revolution Institute's resources. Um, I'll share an inquiry lesson plan from the Center for Civic Ed, and then we will certainly leave time for lots of Q&A that you may still have at the end. Um, but throughout the program, you know, it is certainly an interactive program. There will be times where, you know, we will ask you to respond in the chat or to take yourself off of mute and we welcome and encourage your en engagement with us this evening. So please feel free. All right, well, with that, let me hand things over to my colleagues at the American Revolution Institute. Well, thanks, Emily. Um, we've already been introduced and um, there is uh, in the QR code a link to our American Revolution Institute website. And I just want you to know that everything we'll be discussing, talking about tonight um, can be found there. Everything we do um, that, that we discuss, especially for classrooms and for teachers, we have available for free and online. So, um, that is there for you. And uh, my colleagues, again, are Emily Parsons, who's our deputy director and curator. Um, if you come to the Washington, D.C. area, she has just curated a beautiful exhibit on the 200th anniversary of um, Lafayette's visit to the United States. Rachel Nellis in the research um, division at our library, who can help you find anything that you need um, in our rich resources. And I'm the director of education and a former educator um, from Elizabeth Cahill's actually district, um, Wachusett in Massachusetts. Um, I taught at Paxton Center School, seventh and eighth grade history for a long time. So hopefully I will give you some good things to take away tonight. I'm going to just begin by reminding you who the Society of the Cincinnati are, and you're all probably um, very familiar with the Society of the Cincinnati because your educators um, probably interested in the subject of the founding and um, the American Revolution. The Society of the Cincinnati is founded in 1783, just prior to uh, the peace, and um, their their goal is to perpetuate the remembrance of this vast event, which is the American Revolution itself, as the mutual friendships which have been formed under the pressure of common danger and in many instances cemented by the blood of the parties. 
And there are 4,500 members of the society actually active and engaged today, um, preserving that memory of the American Revolution. And uh, post-service, those uh, initial founding members were interested in returning to their citizen life as farmers after that service to the ideals that underpin our republic. The reason for their name, the Cincinnati, is they were motivated by a model from 500 BC. He was a general during the Roman Republic, actually called into service twice to defend Rome's territory the, to defend the Republic and given dictatorial powers and the powers to lead the army um, against the invasions. He does that successfully twice during his tenure and both times returns power back to the Republic and says, I wish to return to my civilian life and to my plow. And on the, the, the on the left, you see actually a statue, a modern statue of him in Cincinnati, Ohio, where he's got the fasces returning power symbolically in one hand, and he's got his hand rested on the plow on the other side. Um, the Society of the Cincinnati take their name from the Roman general Cincinnatus, who both my colleagues will talk more about tonight. They call themselves the Cincinnati, and um, that's very much based on the fact that by the time of the American Revolution, George Washington, who's the figure on the right, obviously, leaning on a fasces, but behind him, you can't see a plow as well. He's being called the American Cincinnatus. Um, most of the Cincinnati will settle initially out in the Ohio territory, or many of them, I shouldn't say most, but many of them settle in um, the Ohio territory with land awards for their service and that's what gives name to Cincinnati, Ohio. So that's where we get that from. Um, the American Revolution Institute comes about many, many years later, Society of the Cincinnati, 1783 and the American Revolution, Revol Revolution Institute, 2012, um, thinking that the best way to preserve the memory of the vast event is to get into K-12 education and the idea is that we want students and everyone to remember that were it not for the American Revolution, we wouldn't have these four very important constructive achievements, our independence, our republic, our national identity, and our highest ideals, which are freedom, liberty, equality, civic responsibility, and natural and civil rights. And this is from a very popular blog post actually at our website. Just the revolutionary generation did not complete the work of creating a truly free society, which requires overcoming layers of social injustice, exploitation, other forms of institutionalized oppression that have accumulated over many centuries. The wisest of our revolutionaries understood this, anticipated that creating a truly free society would take many generations. And that's what we seek to do is educate people on the achievements and um, understand that what we do today and uh, our rights today are foundational to the original achievement of independence. Anyway, um, some more things for our teacher audience to talk about. Um, first of all, our headquarters actually uh, is in Washington, DC, DuPont Circle area. You're seeing Anderson House, on the left, um, which is our headquarters and home to our annual master teachers seminar residential week, um, which actually some of our master teachers are in view on the top right, uh, standing around George uh, Cannon, who was cast in 1777, one of fewer than 10 American made cannon fired in Philadelphia by James Buyers, but the uh, teachers that come to us stay with us for a week and they research in our library every afternoon. In the mornings, they participate in scholarship. The entire week is fellowship. We usually reserve the number of teachers that we allow to come to our seminar to about seven. And um, we're very proud of our teacher week and we hope 
perhaps you all would consider applying and coming in, creating some of the resources that we have at our website for teachers, which are all based upon the fact that we have a museum and a library. And actually our museum is, our museum space, our exhibition space is pictured on the left. We have an annual exhibition right now. It's Lafayette's, um, the Bicentennial of Lafayette's tour, which features uh, library and museum objects. Our library has over 50,000 rare and modern objects. Uh, modern is 1820 to the present, um, rare obviously prior to that. Um, and our museum has over 5,000 objects or around, I, I, Emily may be cringing, around 5,000 objects. Um, our museum objects are Revolutionary War centered, Society of the Cincinnati uh, centered and also based on our home, which is given to us by a family called the Andersons, who left many objects in our care as well. And um, the library focuses on the revolution and the 18th century art of war. And at our website, you're going to find, with regard to K-12 resources, you go to the classroom section and you can see the pull down menu highlighted here, things like our classroom videos, um, our collections for the classroom, which are specially curated objects from the library and museum collections around a theme. You see information about reserving our free traveling trunks, which travel all around the country um, at no cost. You see our uh, educational video game called Revolutionary Choices, which you can play online or download through Apple or Google. And um, our teaching associate sign up page, as well as two other things, our lesson plans, many of which are developed by our master teachers who you see here in our library, looking at different museum objects and library objects. And um, you can also look at professional development like what we're doing tonight and potentially sign up to come and be one of our master teachers. The application for our 2025 Master Teacher Week, which is going to be from July 13th through the 19th, opens on November 22nd. So I encourage you to do that. Um, anyway, so we're going to get into our close object viewing. Hopefully I am pretty much on schedule here. We're going to look at this item from our library collections, actually, and I want to ask everyone that's in attendance and maybe someone who can help me monitor chat um, or mute, unmute yourselves and participate. What do you see? What do you think? What do you wonder about this item from the collection, especially relative to our Republic and our founding principles? And what is this primary source attempting to tell us? Or how would you use it in the classroom? So let's look at it. And what do you see? What is it? I know it's en français. Founders of Liberty, but in French. French. Oh, it does look like a yearbook. I love that. Oh, you could totally, that just makes me think of, you could make this into some kind of sorority composite, fraternity composite, the high school players, symbols of liberty, ladies and gentlemen, their heads. Well, yes, someone sees Voltaire, absolutely. Franklin, and Franklin's so obvious, is there another American that you see there that isn't maybe as recognizable until you are able to perhaps look in and see his name? There's another American. These people have influence affect the European Enlightenment and revolutionary ideas. Indeed, we, we notice this is French. Martyrs of Liberty. Washington, there we go. Does that look like Washington? No. <laughs> Do people in... What does this make you think about this, this primary source? And I will give you a hint and tell you that it's an engraving um, from hmm, 1794. They don't know what he looks like. Absolutely. Do they care? <laughs> Let me 
yeah, no photos. And they don't do, I, they don't care because he's, yeah, you can't read them. Well, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to do this, which is going to let you get a little closer to it. If I had re revealed that you could, if you have a phone, look in, yes, look in a little closer. And Mark, put the link in there as well. You can zoom in through our digital library. You can read the names. And this this kind of gives things away. But um, let, let me just give it away for now. This is an engraving, as I mentioned, from 1794, which is, you know, we're, we're into the reign of terror. So we have the line at the bottom, the, the uh, figures that represent the martyrs of liberty. And obviously we're in French here. So that's having to do with the French Revolution. But in the middle, we see exemplars of Republican virtue. And you should see, in addition to Franklin, recognizing Franklin and seeing Washington and maybe um, with good eyes, seeing Rousseau and Voltaire and Brutus and Demosthenes, Demosthenes and Cato. Um, and at the top, I may have to censor this for the middle school audience, maybe the high school audience as well, but you see allegorical figures of um, these ideals that uh, are common to the French and the American revolutions. And what I wanted to show you more in addition to this is that we have a little lesson plan on this and the QR code here goes right to that lesson plan. And what it does, its intention is to examine the ideological influences on the American and the French revolutions on their republics. And we know what happens in France. We know what happens in America. We know what happens in France um, when they attempt those early republics. But you're also, the, through this lesson plan, learning about historical figures who championed ideals valued by um, republics, uh, representative democracies, and understanding how those republican ideals inspire political and reform movements and social change around the world to this day. So I hope you might check that out and maybe uh, censor those if you need to. I mean, it, like I said, in middle school, I probably would have done a little little blurring on them, sorry. Uh, they are in, in situ as, as they exist. Uh, one more little item I want to show you before I turn it over. Um, to my colleagues is something else from our collections. This is also from the library collections. This is from 1810. So it's it's not in our modern collection. It's, it's still in our rare collection. It's called the Patriots Monitor for New Hampshire, um, designed to impress and perpetuate the first principles of the revolution on the minds of youth, together with some pieces interesting and, or important and interesting adapted for the use of schools. And the author, Ignatius Thompson, who was a reverend um, in Vermont, actually also did a version of this for Vermont, slightly different. He was 36 when he put this volume together. And just to give you a little perspective, the size of this volume, were you to come to the American Revolution Institute and look at it, smaller than a pencil. That's a tiny paper clip there that I put in for perspective. And it is um, over 200 pages. It has 35 different entries. Um, but what's really kind of neat about it is this is what he feels um, at the time in 1810 that every American needs to understand and appreciate, not just every American, but every, let's say, eighth grader should understand about the Republic in order to appreciate um, what we have uh, in this new American or this new United States. So if we look at the table of contents, and again, there are 35 things, they're not put in chronological order. They're actually, I, you know, it, it's semi um, chronological, but put in order of importance, according to this gentleman, the Declaration of Independence is first. Um, and then we go down through uh, General Washington's appointment. But the third one is his address uh, to the army in November, 1783. So we're going from 1776 to 1775, his appointment, and now to 1783, 
Every American officer, this is from his address, and soldier must now console himself for any unpleasant circumstances which may have occurred by a recollection of the uncommon scenes in which he has been called to act in no inglorious part and the astonishing events of which he has been a witness, events which have seldom, if ever, taken place on the stage of human action nor can probably ever happen again. I think it's neat to go back and look at these things and think about the snapshot in time in which they were presented, the idea that this was really vital and important in understanding our republic and how it was shaping and um, what needed to be remembered, especially by school children in this tiny, tiny volume, by the way, um, for eighth graders or under. I mean, if you're thinking about New Hampshire in 1810, I think we're thinking about through eighth grade. Uh, the, his next entry is from December 24th, 1783. So a little bit chronological here. It's his George Washington's resignation of command. And I'm going to read you a little bit from that, just thinking about what he said. Having finished the work assigned to me, I retire from the great theater of action and bidding an affectionate farewell to this august body under whose orders I have long acted, I here offer my commission and take my leave of all the employments of public life. We know Washington doesn't quite do that, but this gives him or, or fortifies him as America's Cincinnatus, the idea that I'm going to step away from power. I'm given this great responsibility and I'm stepping away. And what a teachable thought that is these days, potentially. Um, the, the fifth entry is his circular letter, which I know my colleague Rachel is going to get into, which is June 18th, 1783. So he's jumping backwards now. And again, I think he's putting these in, in order of importance as he feels young students should understand them. Um, so a little bit from that, there are four things which I humbly conceive are essential to the well-being. I may even venture to say the existence of the United States is as an independent power. First, an indissoluble union of the states under one federal head. Secondly, a sacred regard for public justice. Thirdly, the adoption of a proper peace establishment. And fourthly, the prevalence of that pacific and friendly disposition among the people of the United States, which will induce them to forget their local prejudices and policies to make those mutual concessions and policies which are requisite to the general prosperity and in some instances to sacrifice their individual advantages to the interest of the community. And how, how magnanimous and, and important an example do you have there from Washington? And my last slide is thinking about the Patriots Monitor done in 1810 and the idea that as teachers, you take some 21st century examples, maybe, um, and compare them like these three, um, a Patriots Handbook by Caroline Kennedy, where she includes these same things, but adds, can a woman be president of the United States by Eleanor Roosevelt? Or you look at a Patriots history reader and they, um, by uh, Larry Schweikert, Dave Doherty, and Michael Allen, and they add things like Roe versus Wade to theirs. Or you look at America, a Patriotic Primer by Lynn Cheney, and she reminds you that C is for the Constitution that binds us together. And I wonder, would you give yourself the exercise or even your students the exercise of putting together some essential pieces of, of um, America's history to understand our republic and to foundationally think about where we are, where we've come from, and where we have to go? Um, I don't have a lesson on that yet. So I invite those teachers who are in the audience who haven't applied for the Master Teacher Institute to come and perhaps uh, dive in our collections, spend half a day for that week that they're with us and put something together. So uh, I am going to pass it off now to my colleague, Rachel Nellis. Great, thanks, Stacia. <clears throat> and I know Stacia introduced the library wonderfully. 
Um, I'd want to just add that among our rare collections are um, manuscripts, maps, prints, engravings, um, rare books published before 1820, the Society of the Cincinnati Archives. So um, all of these items are contemporary to the revolutionary era. So really a, a wealth of information in our library and um, a number of items available in our digital library as well, like the circular letter that Stacia already introduced actually. <laughs> so it fits very well. Um, so I thought this was appropriate for the conversation about, you know, civic duty, civic responsibility. Um, in June 1783, um, this circular letter was published. Um, it's just over five inches tall and 52 pages. Um, and it's addressed to the governors of the several states from George Washington. And it actually is one of his longest addresses to the public, as well as his final official communication to the governors of the 13 states as General Washington. Um, it's written before the finalization of the Treaty of Paris, and Washington reflected on the achievement of independence and offered his opinions on how the nation had to proceed to maintain that independence and survive as a new nation. Um, within the text, he immediately states that he is preparing to resign his commission into the hands of Congress and, quote, return to that domestic retirement, which it is well known I left with the greatest reluctance before I carry this resolution into effect. I think it a duty incumbent on me to make this my last official communication. And then continuing through the opening text of the letter, he wrote, at this auspicious period to the United States, um, came into existence as a nation, and if their citizens should not be completely free and happy, the fault will be entirely their own. This is the moment when the eyes of the whole world are turned upon them. This is the moment to establish or ruin their national character forever. Um, and then he goes on to lay out the four um, tenants that Stacia already went over, but I'll say them again. Um, so an indissoluble union of the states under one federal head, pretty clear. Um, the adoption of a proper peace establishment, so creating a uniform militia throughout the new states um, that are regularly trained to serve when needed. And then two that I think are especially relevant to today is a sacred regard to public justice. So this is focusing on paying back the public debt, um, paying back the debt of the war that was accrued, making sure that they can remain not go into bankruptcy, remain respectable to their peers in Europe. Um, but it also, Washington insists in this part on the fulfillment of Congress's promise of full and fair compensation to soldiers, officers, and veterans of the revolution for their service to their country during the war. Um, writing, it was a part of, <clears throat> it was a part of their hire, it was the price of their blood and of your independency. It is therefore more than a common debt, it is a debt of honor. Um, and then the fourth one, the prevalence of that pacific and friendly disposition among the people of the United States, which will induce them to forget their local prejudices and policies, um, etc. And it's interesting to me that the first three that he lists, um, he goes on for the rest of the letter, basically really going in depth in what he means, what is he talking about, um, get, he's very clear. And then for the fourth one, which is just encouraging peaceful relations between the states and citizens, um, respecting each other, all of that, he just leaves it with that one um, paragraph. Um, oh, I forgot to change the slide, um, which you can see in the um, on page 17, fourthly, um, that's all he says about it. So I think he's intending it to be very clear right there what he means. Um, and then to end the letter, Washington bid farewell to public life and added a prayer writing that he would incline the hearts of the citizens to cultivate a spirit of subordination and obedience to government, to entertain a brotherly affection and love for one another, for their fellow citizens of the United States at large, and particularly for their brethren who have served in the field. Um, the text of the circular letter was widely circulated in newspapers, as broadsides, and in book form, and the book was published and distributed in major cities across the United States and abroad, including Fishkill, New York, Newport, Boston, Hartford, Richmond, and London, as well as our library's um, Philadelphia edition. 
So a really special object, and this is all available on our digital library. Um, and it's actually incredibly easy to read, which is nice and large text and all of that. So, okay, so the next item is um, the institution of the Society of the Cincinnati, which we have in our collections. So a month before the publication of Washington's circular letter, um, in May 1783, the Society of the Cincinnati was founded and it took its name from Lucius Quintus Cincinnatus, the classical symbol of civic virtue, who I know Emily will continue talking about when it's her turn. Um, it was not unusual for a group like the Society, the first patriotic organization in the United States, to look to Rome um, and antiquities. Uh, the classical world had served as a foundation for the new American ideals that were burgeoning during the war and after the war. Um, the founding document of the society was signed in Newburgh, New York by the officers present. You can see Washington's signature right at the top there. Um, and it lays out the tenets and organizational structure of the society, as well as details of what the society's insignia should look like going forward. So some of these tenets included um, to preserve human rights and liberties for which the officers fought and died for, um, to promote and cherish between the states the union so essentially necessary to their happiness and the future dignity of the American empire, to pledge brotherly kindness in all things, including providing aid to officers and their families in need. And this included contributing one month's pay to create a fund dedicated to the relief of fellow veterans and their widows um, when needed. And then you can see that parallel between the values that Washington actually wrote out in his circular letter to the governors as well. Through the institution, the society impressed upon the members to follow the example of Cincinnatus and George Washington by returning to their citizenship and being active participants in civic life. Um, the emblem of the society was created to depict Cincinnatus and it's described in the institution as the principal figure Cincinnatus, three senators presenting him with a sword and other military ensigns, on a field in the background, his wife standing at the door of their cottage. Near it, a plow and instruments of husbandry, round the whole, omnia reliquit, surveyor rem publicum. And on the reverse, sun rising, a city with open gates and vessels entering the port. Fame crowning Cincinnatus with wreath inscribed virtutis premium. Below, hands joined, supporting a heart with the motto esto perpetua. And round the whole, Societas Cincinnatorum Instituta 1783. The medal described is seen here as an ink drawing by Pierre L'Enfant. And you can see both the obverse and reverse. Um, and this is also available online. And the medal itself was actually never struck until the early 20th century. But the society did take um, L'Enfant's drawing and design and incorporated it into the eagle insignia that officers of the Society of the Cincinnati still wear today. So you can see on this one, um, the, the same design of Cincinnatus on the um, back of the eagle. And then it's also featured on the society's membership diplomas, um, which is on the right of the screen, which is something that the officers would have paid to have to indicate their membership. But you can see that in the bottom left and right corner, that medal um, that Lanfont drew in ink on the previous slide is represented here. So I think with that, I will hand it over to Emily Parsons to continue talking about Cincinnatus. Thank you, Rachel and Stacia and Emily. Um, before I get into this, um, I just have three objects from our museum collections um, to highlight for you and wanted to take the opportunity for a quick plug. Um, as you're thinking about using these kinds of resources in your classroom, um, don't forget works of art, paintings, three-dimensional objects, 
museum collections in general, um, that you can use as primary sources in similar ways that you use printed or manuscript sources um, that are probably more used to using in the classroom. Um, but these kinds of things, especially three-dimensional objects, um, can sometimes speak to students in different ways. Um, even if you have reproductions in the classroom, they can be this sort of tactile, tangible um, source that, that kids can sort of mull over, handle, try and figure out what it is, kind of be their own, own historian or curator. So um, that's my plug. <laughs> and we are here to help um, if you need images or um, as you know, Stacia's lesson plans um, have made use of these as well and are great examples. So we've talked about Cincinnatus a good bit um, as both the namesake of the Society of the Cincinnati and otherwise a longstanding figure in both, in, in particularly European history. So a lot of these symbols that the society and the American nation at large are using to represent their identity and um, ideals um, are not new, kind of repurposed for this new American nation. Um, Cincinnatus had been common in 16th, 17th, 18th century Europe. And so you find him um, in a lot of works of art, um, including this painting here, which is by a Swiss born artist, Angelica Kaufman. Um, and it's, uh, but but painted during the revolutionary era um, in the late 18th century. Um, and this is depicting the second half of what's normally told as Cincinnatus's story or the, the iconic moments in his story. The first part being um, him being called to serve Rome, lead Rome's armies, as you just saw on the obverse of the society's medal. Um, here we have the end of that story coming home triumphant back to his plow. So you see here um, being welcomed by the citizenry um, back to these kind of tools of husbandry, back to his civilian life. Um, and we've also, you've heard a little bit as well about George Washington being referred to as the American Cincinnatus. Um, his contemporaries obviously saw similarities between Cincinnatus's story and Washington's sort of selfless service to his country, um, not taking a um, salary while he was leading his country's armies against um, foreign invaders, um, as you will, um, resigning power after victory was secured and then returning to their farm, a citizen of a new Republic. Um, and you heard from Stacia, an excerpt from Washington's address to Congress, December of 1783, when he was resigning his commission, which um, maybe since Cincinnati was unheard of, and George III himself is in England is just aghast that you know how great of a man indeed could have actually relinquished the power that Washington did. Um, of course, the the place where Cincinnati and Washington depart is that Cincinnati did serve Rome and then retire back to his farm. Washington did that, but then he jumped back into the fray, became president and performed all of those incredibly important um, sort of country changing um, acts that he did as the first president. Um, so he took that that mantle of power back, um, but he still it still rings true um, him being sort of the American first American embodiment of um, of Cincinnati. Um, this story and this imagery persisted in America into the 19th century and would have been still pretty familiar to educated Americans. Um, and I'll say that it was Henry Knox, uh, the Massachusetts officer who ended up heading Washington's artillery service, was a Boston bookseller before the war, uh, rather bookish. Um, he is credited with um, the idea for the society in the first place and the name. So he's probably the one who connected um, the ancient story of Cincinnati with the Society of the Cincinnati, which gets its name from simply the plural of Cincinnati. Um, and so I think rightly makes the point that it wasn't just Washington who embodied these virtue virtues. Um, Cincinnati plural means that all of these men um, who served their country in this revolution deserve 
um, this name. Um, and you get in the 19th century, some other American revolutionaries who are pictured in Cincinnatus sort of style um, imagery. Um, Israel Putnam of Connecticut, for example, is one. Um, so that persists, although I would imagine today, the vast majority of Americans could not tell you who Cincinnatus was. Um, so jumping off of that theme of symbols, um, we have lots of these symbols from both classical um, antiquity and kind of early modern Europe that um, the American revolutionaries are familiar with and are employing to um, express the identity of this new nation and what binds um, these people together. So here we have some of this expressed in a very sort of common household good, um, something that would have communicated this in a much broader way um, than say a fine painting that would have just been in, in a wealthy person's house. Um, so this is a toile or a, um, a printed textile. Um, you see the long image on the right is the full piece that we have in our collections. The wider image on the left is a detail of the single, uh, one single um, image of the pattern. So this is a repeating pattern. Um, would have been um, would have been made with copper plates. Um, so instead of printing on a piece of paper to make an engraving, you would have printed on this cotton and linen blend. And you, they were making these into bed hangings and bed furnishings. So um, quilts and coverlets and draperies, upholstery elsewhere in your home. Um, there were entire kind of bedsteads um, that were full of this. They printed it. It was all in a single color, but the color changed sometimes. So you get greens and blues and purples. This was incredibly fashionable. And perhaps surprisingly made in England about 1785. So just within a few years of losing this war, losing the main portion of their North American colonies, there were English merchants and craftsmen who regardless of patriotism or politics saw money to be made in producing patriotic American goods for this new market. And they produced an extraordinary quantity of goods like this, whether they were ceramics that you would use in your kitchen, these sorts of household furnishings, um, all of them expressing these same sorts of allegorical figures and ideals of this new American Republic. So if I can zoom into the scene we have here. Um, you can see on the left the wider view of George Washington um, standing with some female figures, um, all centered around this altar of liberty as it's identified in the middle. Um, on top of the altar, you have liberty with the, the pole and liberty cap sitting there um, on top. Um, on the left next to Washington is the allegorical figure of peace, and she's stomping on a shield representing these arms of war. And then overhead, which you can sort of see better on the right hand image, is the winged figure fame trumpeting the American victory, holding a laurel wreath of victory over Washington's head. And what we can't quite see, I think I cut it off, unfortunately, is um, a, a banner with small words on it that she holds that says Washington and independence. So these, these primary figures of liberty, peace, and fame um, really kind of screamed <laughs> to anyone looking at this in the 18th and 19th centuries, um, these American ideals. And the other female figures here, you see they're all holding these oval medallions. Um, and these bear portraits of, um, what were considered sort of the luminaries of the American Revolution, both political and military. Oh, there's one more important figure that is actually unique to us. Kneeling in front of the altar, holding one of these oval medallions with a headdress is a figure of America. Um, so, so we get her. And in these figures, you have um, signers of the Declaration, you have congressmen, and spread across 
the geography of the new colonies. Um, you do have a couple, although fewer, of military officers. Um, the General von Steuben, for example, Horatio Gates, um, and Washington. Those are our military officers who are here. But you get John Adams, Henry Lawrence, Governor Morris and John Jay, both from New York, Henry William Henry Drayton of South Carolina, um, Sam, John Dickinson. Um, um, so from an English perspective, interesting to see that's kind of who they picked as these luminaries of the revolution. Um, but then from an artistic standpoint, combined them with uh, these allegorical figures communicating the ideals of this new nation. And then our last piece has become a real favorite um, of the staff and our teachers. Um, jumping forward to the Civil War era. All right, and I'm just going to jump in and say, and Ricky Davenport, who wrote a lesson plan using this, um, which is at our website, and I'll jump right. Thank you, Stacia. Yes. Um, so we, I think we have a, a formal written lesson and perhaps other teachers who have um, taken this on themselves as well in their classrooms. Um, so this is a Civil War era product of Milton Bradley and Company, the Milton Bradley toy maker you know today. Um, got their start in Springfield, Massachusetts earlier in the 19th century um, as makers of educational toys um, for children. So this was one of their educational toys. It's this cardboard, humble, um, printed piece um, that was meant to be a theatrical presentation of early American history. And you see these metal handles at the top. Um, what's behind this sort of theatrical stage is a really long scroll of 24 images. And the child who was showing this to their friends or family would go use the handles, turn from one image to the next and go through colonial and revolutionary America. So there are 12 images selected of revolutionary America um, to have children learn about and then present to their families. It came boxed with two tickets and a, a pretty sarcastic advertising poster that you could use to entice people to come to your show and um, a script that was dense and extensive. Um, and what we, one of the things we love about this is that you see what someone in the 1860s, like Milton Bradley, chose. What 12 scenes did they choose to represent the revolution to this incredibly general, broad audience? Um, what should children know about the revolution in the 1860s? And they're all drawn from popular prints. They're sort of simplified versions of popular prints at the time. So you have things that are still famous today that we would expect our children to know. The surrender of Cornwallis at Yorktown, kind of last major battle that um, secured victory in the revolution for the Americans. That's what you're seeing here. And a little bit better known things still, hopefully on the left you have um, the Battle of Bunker Hill and the death of General Joseph Warren um, after John Trumbull's painting that's at the Capitol. Uh, that's what you're seeing on your left. Um, on your right, you're seeing um, the capture of John Andre in 1780 outside West Point where he has he's um, captured by three New York militiamen and is discovered with the plans of West Point in his boot that Benedict Arnold had given to him, which reveals Benedict Arnold's treason. Um, that one may not be quite as well known. Although the painting that this is based on, an 1840s painting, is, is one of the great gems of revolutionary era art. But then you have images of events that hardly anyone, I think even sometimes in these local areas, remembers or teaches today. On the left, you have the Battle of Sullivan's Island. I think our Charlestonians actually do often talk about this. <laughs> um, the Battle of Sullivan's Island in Charleston Harbor, June of 1776. Um, this was the first battle of the war in the South, um, an unexpected victory for the Americans, repelling the British um, from Charleston Harbor. Um, but something that, and something clearly that in mid 19th century America was well remembered, um, but not so today. On the right hand side, I think even more obscure, 
um, you have General Israel Putnam of Connecticut. Um, and Israel Putnam's ride was apparently this, this sort of famous often told event where he escaped um, sort of uh, uh, surprisingly from a uh, British Dragoon Regiment changed, that was chasing him and went down this impossibly steep slope and survived to tell the tale. Um, and he, Israel Putnam was this folk hero in Connecticut um, from both the French and Indian Revolutionary Wars, um, also well remembered in the mid 19th century, not today. Um, so I know that our teachers have loved to present this to students and you can do this for any time period. You could even do it as a way to have them introduce themselves. Um, just ask, you know, however many, 12, 6, 10, um, how many, what images would you choose that you think are the most important images to tell the story of this event, this period? Um, and I think you, know, you can make it out of a shoebox and um, have them presented. And I think it's been a really fun and effective way to take this historical object and think about the legacy of the revolution and, and what you would want um, to take away from it today. And that I think does it for, for us. All right, well, th thank you all so much. And this, this has been just like a, a great journey through a lot of different kinds of artifacts that you have, a lot of different kinds of documents that you have, all of which provide, I think, really helpful entry points into different eras of American history, but also different ways that the founders and the framers were thinking about history as well. Um, so I'll briefly introduce the Center for Civic Ed at this point. So Center for Civic Ed, um, we are dedicated to promoting civic knowledge, skills, and dispositions. And our aim is to prepare students to become active and informed participants in democratic society. So through our two flagship programs, We the People, the Citizen and the Constitution, and Project Citizens, we aim to help students and their teachers uh, foster inquiry-based classroom environments. So all of our materials are built around this uh, philosophy of inquiry and asking lots of questions and looking at things in different ways. So our approach to everything that we do is built around the 5E model of education. So engaging students with big questions, um, which has been beautifully modeled by my fellow co-presenters today. So we've had big questions, um, exploring different perspectives and uh, different historical contexts, which again, we have had fabulous exploration today. Um, and then we would build upon that to encourage our students to explain complex ideas and elaborate on them further by connecting them to contemporary issues. And then finally, for students to evaluate their understanding through different critical thinking or informed action projects. Um, so what I have for you today kind of ties in to We the People, the Citizen, and the Constitution Unit 1. Um, so all of my fellow presenters here have also presented content that applies to Unit 1. Um, so the way that We the People is structured the first unit of study has to do with the historical and philosophical understandings that the founders and framers would have had. So all of those references to Cincinnatus, uh, the references to ancient Greece and Rome, um, the references to the revolutionary era, all of those things were part of the ideas swirling around in the framers' minds um, as we get to 1787. So um, similarly to some of the great questions posed earlier about, you know, what does it mean to have someone in a position of power who steps aside or even, you know, questions of what symbols would be appropriate for the new America. Um, we also have at the, the point of the end of the Revolutionary War, uh, a period in which the founders and the what become the framers, um, it is clear to them that our stopgap form of government, the Articles of Confederation, are not working, um, and that a, a more um, robust structure is probably in order. 
Um, but in order to do that, the framers, including James Madison, um, start to do a lot of thinking about the sort of philosophy of government in general. And one of the questions, or certainly one of the ones that they mull over is why do people need government in the first place? Um, so what I have for you today is an inquiry lesson, which you are welcome to use whether or not you have access to the We the People curriculum. Um, this You can use this lesson anytime, anywhere. And the idea here is that the students will be presented with the big compelling question, why do we need rules and laws? So I'm going to walk you through the lesson. We'll do some of this um, in an, what I hope is an engaging manner, and then we'll leave you with a lesson plan um, here tonight. All right, so the objective, of course, is that the students will understand why we need rules and laws, and they will take a look at real world scenarios in order to do it. The materials are really easy and included in the lesson themselves. Um, there'll be a couple of short videos. There is a see, think, and wonder organizer, which Stacia actually walked you through in the first place. Um, what do you see? What do you think? What do you wonder? Um, and then there's an exit ticket involved as well. Okay, so you would kick off this lesson in your own classroom with the big question, why do we need rules or laws? And just open that up for the floor to discuss in your classroom. So once you've had the students make some predictions, have a little bit of an introductory discussion, we will do a short video, which we'll show you in just a second. Um, there'll be a class discussion. Then we'll introduce some of the philosophers behind the founders thinking. And then the students will have another opportunity to revisit the discussion about why rules and laws are needed. All right, so I'm going to pose this to you and I hope you'll you'll engage here in the chat. Um, just have your student hat on here for a moment. What do you see, think and wonder about the video that we are about to watch? Okay, so you all get the idea, um, and I love the I love your initial discussions here. So, seeing, thinking, and wondering, um, there are no lines on this road. So, excellent observation off the bat. There's an enormous amount of trust placed in the other drivers. Absolutely, Rhett, um, Glenn. I hope that downtown Owenton is nowhere near that bad, but maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, Elizabeth has a similar question to me, which is, I don't know how anyone survives. Um, it must be very scary to cross the street. Um, and you I mean, just basic questions. How, how does anyone know whose turn it is? I guess you just go and hope for the best. Um, but this is all intended to jog students' thoughts about what would life be without a, a clear universal understanding of traffic laws, uh, let alone other laws. Okay. So this will then kick off a discussion for you in class about the philosophies of Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. Um, and certainly both of these thinkers are very influential on the founding generation. So we are just very briefly here, Thomas Hobbes believes that the 
essentially the life in the state of nature, if we have no government, if we have no rules, if we have no laws, then everyone is essentially out for him or herself, and life will be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Um, so there's chaos and violence, and people ultimately agree to a social contract in a, because it will essentially help them survive. Um, John Locke has a slightly more positive view of how things will turn out in a, a state of nature where there are no rules or laws. He sees this as a place where people are free and equal and rational, and that everyone is entitled to the rights of life, liberty, and property, and the purpose of government is to protect rights, and so people enter into the social contract in order to form a civil society. So it, it would be fun then to have the conversation with students to say, okay, whose philosophy do you think was represented in the video we just watched? Um, and where might we see some ideas of John Locke that could be put in place to help make that situation somewhat less chaotic? Um, so you, your lesson, of course, may may go quite a bit longer, and our lesson plan does include a short video on both of those two philosophers that that you're welcome to use. All right, and then the next activity that we would encourage the students to do this is a, a cute fun one which given that we just had some discussion tonight about what can we learn from imagery <laughs> um, we do have this cartoon that you could share with students uh, either individually or in small groups where we would encourage uh, the students to caption this little cartoon here so i'll, I'll give us a, a couple minutes if you would like to take a stab at it to make a, a caption for this cartoon gloria i love that one <laughs> Yeah, Stacia says, every man is an island. Um, Ricky says, mine. <laughs> yep, Y'all have some, some great ideas here. I wish someone would invent sports. <laughs> um, so yeah, the students could have quite a lot of fun with that. Um, yeah, absolutely. So thank you for, for playing along. Um, and the exit ticket that we have in the lesson certainly does allow the students to have some concluding thoughts about the discussion that they've learned for the day. Um, and then also for you as the educator, there are opportunities for active learning and critical thinking that the students are demonstrating. Um, and then real world application and social awareness as well. So this is simply a lesson that you could use to kick off those further discussions. Um, and as far as differentiating the activity, um, Izetta, I definitely appreciate your comment uh, in the chat. You could use any number of different videos if you feel like there would be one that the students would also enjoy discussing. Um, that shows, you know, anything at all in a state with it that seems maybe a little bit confusing. Um, your example here of a game where there's referees disagreeing. Absolutely. There's a lot of different options that you can pick. All right. And so there, there is a link that you could give this lesson a try. Um, again, it's it's available for for free. You don't have to have any access to the We the People curriculum to be able to use it. Um, yeah, and so we hope you have found that one to be useful. Uh, this is certainly something you could use with elementary, upper elementary, middle or high school students just to kick off a good discussion um, in class. So yeah, and we hope that you're also able to utilize a lot of the uh, lessons and resources that have been shared by the uh, American Revolution Institute as well. Um, <clears throat> so with that, I'm you know, happy to have any questions posed to any of our presenters here in the chat, um, or if you'd like, you can take yourself off mute and ask a question as well. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We've really appreciated your engagement, and we look forward to seeing you at 
a future webinar or perhaps your application to be a master educator um, with the American Revolution Institute. All right, thank you, Glenn, and thank you to all of the C's and JMLPE teachers for joining us. <laughs> hey, uh, thank you, Emily, uh, and thank you all. Uh, it was very informative. Uh, so that's a nice resource, and it's uh, plug it in nice uh, as we kind of get into unit one. So, so, so thank you. Uh, all right, have a good evening. Thanks, hey there, I, I may have missed it, but are you going to um, send a certificate of attendance? Um, that, thank you so much. That's a great question. If you would like a certificate of attendance, um, you can reach out to me directly. I'm going to put my email in the chat here. Great. Thank you. I'm happy to send you one. We don't generally send them pro forma, but I'm happy to do that. <laughs> thank you. I have to recertify this year. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Hey, have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.